be silent. There's a faith that rises through the flames. There's a joy that chases the dark away. God, we won't be silent. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious. There's a faith that rises through the flames. There's a joy that chases the dark away. God, we won't be silent. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We lift our voices. Lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices. Lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious as the greater the storm, the louder our song. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. We'll never stop singing. Welcome Annie Grasham, because it's her first time with us today. We do appreciate her bringing her parents with us, with her, Tyler and Jessica, and her older sister who's still waving at me, Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. How are you this morning? Yeah, okay. Okay, that's good. She's very happy to be here. But this is Annie, and as always, it's our custom on the first time that a new one is here. We have a token for the family to remember that, encouraging you to bring her often and as long as you can, and one of our shepherds will come and have a special blessing for you guys this morning. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, it is amazing how our hearts are instantly given and tied to our kids. And so now as um, Tyler and Jessica have twice experienced the wonder and the glory of that, we lift them up. Um, we pray uh, for them that they would feel the love that we have for them, and more importantly, Father, the love that you have for them, that they would know in the days and weeks and years ahead that as they face the incredibly mundane things of dishes and diapers and laundry and um, the never-ending taxi service, that they would know that those things are also holy, Lord, and that you are in them, that they would talk about you as the inevitable fight breaks out, that they would share your name with the kids as they go to ballet and swim team and, and get them ready for prom and send them off to college, Lord, that they would know that these times are precious that they are charged by the God of the universe to raise these kids up in the fear and admonition of you, and that you, Lord, are faithful to fulfill all your promises and to sustain them in the midst of it. These things we pray over them in your name. Amen. Welcome them. And a portion of this morning's contribution will be going to Tyler to help pay for future weddings. So... <laughs> Hey, if you're a guest this morning, thanks for joining us here at Twickenham. We're so glad you're here. I met some folks from Chattanooga, some folks from Mobile, and so we've got people from all over the place. We're really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. And if you are looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. We'd love to sit down and have a conversation about where you are on your journey, what the Lord's doing in your life. We'll tell you about ours and what the Lord's doing in, in, in our church, and we just love to have you be a part of that. We think we really believe the passage that says that God places the parts of the body just as he wants them to be. 
and we think that you're here, your being here is not an accident. It may be that you have some gift that our church needs or that our church has been gifted in some way that will bless you, and maybe it's both. We don't know. We're just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and put that in the collection plate, which is going to be passed in seconds. So get on with it. You can put down any prayer requests that you have, and we'll be uh, praying over those as early as tomorrow morning. I um, want to welcome a new family this morning, uh, Nick and Kaki Morrow, and their children. They have triplets. Wait a minute, we'll have to split the contribution between them and the graduates. Avery, Calvin, and Elaine, and Nick is the only one in the room, I think. Nick, where, there you are. Stand up, Nick, so folks can see you. Give him a hand. Welcome them. The Avery, Calvin, and Elaine are, are little. They're in the nursery. And Kaki, and this is a new member, is already serving, so I'm just saying that is awesome. We're, we're really glad to have the Morrows. Glad they're here. Hey, let me share a passage with you that, that has to do with not just our, well, it's, it, it's, it's about our money and it's about our praise and how they're connected. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter, eight, uh, chapter 9, Paul says, this service that you perform, which is what we're about to do, we're about to, to take up our contribution. Paul calls it a service. He says, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, people will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And that's what we're going to be doing this morning, thanking God for his indescribable gift. We'll do it in our giving, we'll do it in our singing, our praying, our remembering, and our hearing of his word. So glad you're here today. Let's sing, let's uh, take up this collection. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, wonder glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, wonder glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, wonder glory. Hallelujah. Who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways? Hallelujah, thank the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Revive us again. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise His name. Praise Jehovah. Yes. 
judges all. Praise His name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them pray, their praises give to Jehovah, for His name alone is high. And His glory, His glory is exalted. is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your work to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Would you join us, please? The Lord is good to all. 
He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all. I will worship.
seated. <laughs> this is a weird church. <laughs> it, it just is. Because here's the thing, I, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, um, and I do sometimes, so this is a good time to do it again. Singing is just awesome this morning. You guys did a, a great job. You guys did a great job. So really good, really good morning. The, weird, the reason it's a weird church, if you're coming from a different tradition, um, you, the, the thing is, you're wondering where the band is, right? You're the band, okay? <laughs> and so uh, it's a little bit different because uh, in most churches, you've got you know, the orchestra or the band or whatever, and that's, that's one of the things that make this a weird church is we think that's okay. It's a church of Christ who, who doesn't have a problem with instrumental music, but we really love a cappella. Uh, that's uh, singing without instruments, and we do it well. And so when you walk in the door, you're in the band, which is kind of awesome. Now, tonight at 5 o'clock, we're going to have our instrumental service uh, called The Spring. And so that's why I say it's a weird church, because in the, in the mornings, it's a cappella, and then we have our instrumental service t- tonight, uh, once a month at six o'clock, at 5 o'clock. So, which is another reason it's weird because church is supposed to be at six on Sunday night, right? But we have it at five. So weird, weird, weird. And if you're weird, you'll fit in perfectly. Trust me, you can't be any weirder than who's already here. So anyway, here, here's the, my goal this morning. Everybody talks about how hard family is and how rough family is and how dysfunctional family is. And the thing I want to leave you with this morning is that family's good. It's, it's messy sometimes, but family's good. It's just good. In fact, good things happen in our families. Good things happen in homes. We're talking, we're talking about music here. Um, there was a guy that I grew up with, uh, 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 one of my teachers, a man named Dwight Love. Uh, doc, we called him Dr. Love because uh, he was a math professor. He was a math genius. And uh, he tried with me and failed. Uh, he taught, this guy taught Rhodes Scholars. He had, he had people going to MIT on full ride scholarships and then he had me. And it was like, <laughs> the only numbers I know are the one in the Bible. That's the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus numbers. That's the only one I know and I don't know that one well. I really didn't do well in his classes. Uh, but uh, he was a neat guy and he loved to sing. I mean, he, was a, he loved to sing. And uh, I got a call uh, one day, he was a member at our church over in Atlanta, and I got a call one day that, that he was, he'd been struggling with renal cancer, and he was very near the end, and so they called and said, hey, you better get over here, and so I went over to his house, and uh, when I arrived, there were several other folks from our church who were there, and some of his friends and family, and his wife, Donna, and their three daughters, Beverly, Carol, and Laura, were all gathered around his bed and they were singing to him. And they were all very musically gifted, all four of them, just beautiful. Beverly actually studied voice in New York. So they were really great singers and they were singing to him. And just a little while after I arrived, Doc Love drew his last breath. And I remember we all we're standing there in the room when he passed away and we recited the Lord's Prayer together. And then people do the, we started doing the things that you do when somebody dies, the necessary things, the awkward things, the to keep you busy things, the business things, all the necessary things. But I often, I often think about the closing moments of his life. And the last thing he heard before he saw the face of Jesus 
with, with the voices of the four women he loved most in the world singing him into eternity. And that's a good way to die. Death is, death is always hard, but that's a good way to die. At home, surrounded by friends and family. Good things happen in homes. I don't know how many weddings I've done. I should have kept a count of this, uh, but I've done a bunch of them through the years. Most of them, of course, were held in church buildings, which is fine. And I've officiated ceremonies in beautiful gardens and at beachside retreats and restored antebellum mansions and in county courthouses, just about anywhere. My least favorite place to do a wedding, and this is free advice, is anywhere outside. Okay, God created an engineer who created air conditioning. <laughs> and he did it because he loves us and wants us to feel good. Outdoor weddings are an invitation to trouble. Noisy airplanes, screaming sirens, biting insects. I did one outdoor wedding at a North Georgia mountain retreat on opening day of deer season. Every few seconds, I mean, we're kind of on this little ridge, and it's like, kind of like Huntsville. There's mountains all around, everywhere as far as the eye can see. And every few minutes, <laughs> and every time the groom would jump, it, it got funny. <laughs> I, did, I did one outdoor wedding uh, on the steps of an antebellum mansion, and the steps faced west the direction from which major storms usually come. And sure enough, just as the bride started coming down toward the groom, I looked up and behold, two of the 10 plagues were on the way. <laughs> Darkness and hail. 300 people were about to experience what it was like to be an Egyptian thousand years ago, thousands of years ago. So when she got to the front, I leaned forward to the bride and I said, this is gonna go really quickly. Do you take him? Yes. Do you take her? Yes. Taken. Ladies and gentlemen, we should adjourn to the reception hall. We got in just before climatological Armageddon hit. It was awful. Um, my, my favorite place to do a wedding, my favorite place, is in a home. I mean, in addition to providing the perfect ambiance, the very location symbolizes what's about to happen. We're, we're about to witness the creation of a new home. Not, not that things don't ever go badly in a home wedding. I did a ceremony in a home that was just perfect once. The had a long curving staircase that emptied into a large family room, and the bride was going to sort of glide down that staircase to some beautiful music, and it was going to be epic. Except this was back before music was digitized and immediately downloadable. The main technology was the cassette tape. You remember those? And we discovered 10 minutes before the ceremony that somebody had taped over the wedding music, and we didn't bring a backup. But nobody panicked because we were all Church of Christ. So we congregationally sang the bride down the stairs, we sang a common love, and then when it was over, we, we, we sang the Lord bless you and keep you with the sevenfold amen, without music, and it was, it was epic, it was awesome. Best thing I've ever seen. Good things happen in homes. When I was a kid, I learned to say the books of the Bible, sitting on the end of the sofa under a lamp my mother still has. On I learned that at Shabron Avenue in Buford, Georgia. I discovered my call to preach at the dining room table of that same house. I exercised my imagination in the basement of my grandmother's house. Home is where we celebrate our victories. Home is where we mourn our sorrows. Home is where we live our lives. Good things happen in families and happen in homes. It's not an accident that businesses try to capture a sense of home. Hospitals decorate their delivery rooms to look like something you'd find in a home. Restaurants advertise their food, tastes just like homemade, and we call them funeral homes. We don't call them mortuaries. Some people even call the church building God's house. We, we find 
ways to connect all of these places and things to the concept of home because deep down we know that home is a good thing and that good things happen in homes. And it's not just us and it's not just these days. Many of the most important events in Jesus' life happened in homes. You know, the Magi found Jesus at his home, not the stable. Matthew, Zacchaeus, Peter, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Simon, Peter, all all of those people opened their homes to Jesus. He shared his last meal before his crucifixion with his disciples in the bonus room of a stranger's house. When he healed the lame man by the pool, he told him, get up, take your mat, and go home. When he cast demons out from the man near Decapolis, he told him, go home to your family. He even called heaven my father's house. And Peter called the church, you and me, a spiritual house. So it's not surprising when we read about the early church gathering together, we usually find a meeting in somebody's house. Not always, of course. Sometimes they met in the temple or some other place that was appropriate to their needs. But most of the time, the church, the people, met in homes. And there's a great example of that in Acts chapter 12. You can turn over there if you want to. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. It's the fifth book in the New Testament. Uh, It's written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. So it's a two-volume set, making Luke the most prolific writer in the New Testament. Acts chapter 12 is where we'll be. So let me set it up for you. Herod. A Roman ruler has imprisoned Peter, one of the apostles, and he intends to execute him because it was, it was, uh, he had just executed another apostle, and so it's, he kind of got some political traction out of it, so he's going to try it again. So the church responds to this by gathering at the home of one of their members, a woman named Mary, not Mary the mother of Jesus or Mary Magdalene, but the different Mary. And they gather at Mary's home to pray for Peter's release. And then God, this is a great story. You should go read it sometime. God hears and answers that prayer in a very dramatic, miraculous, powerful kind of way. And the first thing Peter wants to do when when he realizes that he is out of prison is to find the church and tell them that their prayers have been answered. But to find them, he doesn't go to a church building or the temple or a synagogue. He goes to a home. All right, Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. When this had dawned on him, when his miraculous release from prison had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Be, you know what would be a good thing for you to do sometime is just to open up your home and have people. We, we do small groups in our homes on Sunday nights. It would be cool just to have some folks over and just pray. Pray for your street. Pray for your town. Pray for your church. Pray for somebody. Y'all just get together. Don't study. We do a lot of that. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's a good thing. But wouldn't it be cool just to get together in your house and pray? So the church is praying. Verse 13, Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. And he's standing there. Verse 15, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place, probably somebody's house. Good things happen in homes. That doesn't mean that good things can't happen anywhere else, say in a church building, and there's no theological principle at stake here. Christians met in homes not because there was some mandate to do so, but because that's usually the only place they had to meet. But it's good for us to go back and look at historical realities like this because our our lives have become so compartmentalized. Um, Here's what I mean by that. we, we've, always had, we've always had a place to go do our work, right? We, we go to the office or the plant or the lab or the school or the base or, or wherever for work. And then we go to the 
church building for our spiritual pursuits and the gym for exercise and the theater for entertainment and the restaurant for fancy food. And home is the place where we go to get away from it all. Except in the last few years, there's been a blurring of the lines. Some, some of us work from home. I actually wrote part of this sermon sitting at the kitchen counter uh, in, my, in, my, in my home. And many of us have gym equipment in our homes where we hang our dirty clothes. Lots of our homes have media rooms. Um, walk down the street of your neighborhood sometime. I do this sometimes. I walk down my, my, my street and I'll see inside, you see kind of in somebody's house and they have these huge, I could stand across the street and watch TV. It's like a drive-in theater. They don't like that when you do that at their house. But <laughs> we, have, we have these media rooms. And, and then uh, instead of going out, we just stay home and watch movies. And then some of our kids are homeschooled, right? The one line we seem to have a hard time blurring is between the things that normally happen at the church building and the things that happen where we live. Home can be a place of work, a place of exercise, a place of entertainment, a place of education, but we have a hard time seeing it as the center for spiritual growth and expression. It was interesting that Lee alluded to this in his prayer a moment ago when we prayed for the Gresham family. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 21, God has always wanted the home to be a, a place that was devoted, as devoted to the sacred as it is to the secular. We, we, we looked at this last week, but I want, I want us to look at it again. Listen, listen to what Moses says. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors as many as the days that the heaven are above the earth. Even back then, home was to be a place where the ways and words of God were included in the daily routines of living. Prayer, worship, teaching, spiritual direction were to be as much a part of life, of home life, as fixing dinner and washing the clothes and mending fences. We have a hard time doing that these days for lots of reasons. But one of them is that somewhere in the past, the responsibility for much of the sacred instruction parents used to bear was farmed out to spiritual subcontractors. Preachers, Sunday school teachers, children's ministers, youth ministers, and a dozen, dozen other specialists demonstrated that they could provide quality level spiritual instruction. Nobody thought of these positions as a replacement for what should have been happening in our homes, but over time, the idea that spiritual training was the province of the professionals began to take hold. And slowly, quite unintentionally, I'm sure, responsibility for spiritual growth was moved out of the home into the church building. We forgot that good things happen in homes. The point is not that, that Sunday school and youth ministry and technology-enhanced worship services are ineffective and unnecessary. The point is that they are not near enough. If spiritual direction is not happening in our homes, if it's not happening primarily in our homes, neither we nor our children are going to move toward the good away from the messy. Look, I, I know a lot of your kids do this. My, my boys were heavily involved in Little League sports. I was a terrible athlete when I was a kid, horrible athlete when I was a kid. The basketball coach suggested I try soccer because it didn't involve the hands. And so I, when it came time for my boys to get involved, I, I kind of consigned myself to the role of the supportive parent thinking I didn't have anything to offer. So I, you know, I did my turn in the concession stand and I did the cheering from the bleachers and I you know, would bring the snacks for after the game. But after the second or third practice, even before a game, I realized two things. Number one, the guys coaching these kids did not know baseball. And number two, they didn't know kids. And so for the next six or seven years, I coached both boys. And we, were good. we, were, we won a lot. I, told, I, told the, I tried to be Christian about it. 
But I would tell our boys on our teams, I would say, now boys, we're just here to have fun. It's fun to win. Okay? <laughs> and we, <laughs> and we, we won a lot. One of, the, one of the things I learned very quickly was that you could always tell which kids were practicing at home and which were not. I mean, some kids improved every week. They threw the ball with more accuracy and velocity. They caught the ball. Their hand-eye coordination was so much better. They hit the ball more consistently. They played their positions more effectively. And you could just tell that kid's been practicing through the week. Something's going on at home. And then some kids improved, but they did so very, very slowly. Because the only time they practiced was when the coach scheduled a practice. I bet, I bet you teachers would tell me the same thing, right? You can tell when a child is getting academic support at home and you band directors and theater directors, you know when a kid is getting support and practice at home and when they're not. And it applies in the spiritual realm as well. What we do here is essential. Your, your kids need to be in Sunday school. You need to be in Sunday school. You need to be here on a consistent basis for worship and communion and hearing the word of the Lord. But if that's the only time you and I are, are, are nourishing ourselves spiritually, we're going to starve. We've got to have that stuff going on in our homes as well. So there are some reasons why that doesn't happen as much as it should. As I mentioned, one of them is that we farm that out to the professionals, but here's another. I bet if we took a survey, the number one answer of why we don't do that at home would be time. We and our kids are crazy busy. We are crazy busy because of our kids. Boys and girls, it's your fault. Yeah, it's actually mom and dad, right? I mean, this one's got to be at practice at 5. That one has a game in another sport at a different location at 6. And the other one has a dance rehearsal at 6.15 across town. And so you pull through the drive through to get dinner. The kids are doing their homework in the back seat. You're paying bills on your phone at the red light. You volunteer to teach a class at church. Your sister and her brood are coming into town this weekend. And the dog needs to be put down. There's just always stuff that's been going on. Good things might happen in homes, but the truth is you're there so infrequently you'd never know. There's a book called Just Too Busy by a woman named Joanna, Joanne Craft. She says that we are in bondage to busyness. In fact, she and her husband did something really radical a couple of years ago. They decided to take a year-long sabbatical from all extracurricular activities they called it their radical sabbatical. They, here's how they decided what not to do. If mom had to back the minivan out of the garage, they didn't do it. Instead, they stayed home. They had dinner together as a family. Each month, one of the children got to pick out a weekend family field trip. The kids got to decide what, what that family's going to do on that weekend. They, they read, they played games, they spent time together as a family, and the kids absolutely hated it at first. And then they loved it. You should check it out. Interesting story. Now, that may not be for you, or it might be. It is at least good to spend a few minutes when you're in traffic this week thinking about whether it's really a good idea for you and your family to live at your current pace. Here's something that would be really interesting. Sometime soon, maybe this afternoon, calculate how many days your kids are going to be in your home. Go, go to August of the year they graduate from high school because that's when they're going to go to college or presumably leave home for whatever they're going to do next. Count back from August of the year they graduate from high school, how many days that is. That's your budget. That's how many days you have to spend with your children in your home, shaping them to be disciples of Jesus. How do you want to spend that time? How do you want to spend that time? Good things happen when families have time together at home. So did anything good happen 
in Mary's home the night Peter showed up at the door? Well, even before God miraculously enabled Peter's escape, there was a house full of people on their knees in prayer. That's a good thing. Later on in Acts, we learn that John Mark, Mary's son, accompanied Paul and Barnabas on a missionary trip, and honestly, it didn't go well initially. He later on became a very capable companion to Barnabas and later still to Paul. And some say that the gospel he authored, the gospel of Mark, was really the reflections of Peter, the apostle who came knocking on his mom's door the night the church gathered at her house to pray. Good things happen in homes. One of the stories Mark tells, in fact, begins this way. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city A man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Has it ever occurred to you how symbolic and powerful it would have been had Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples in the temple? He could have. I mean, Passover lamb having his last meal with his disciples in the temple, instituting the Lord's Supper, that would have been really powerful. It was the grandest structure of the day, the perfect location for something as significant as the institution of a lasting ordinance like the Lord's Supper. But when it came time to initiate a memorial to his death, to his burial, to his resurrection, Jesus didn't choose the temple. He chose a table in the bonus room of somebody's house. In a moment, we're going to celebrate that memorial. And I know it's not going to be an easy thing to do, but it might help make this a meaningful time for you. If we could imagine this is just a big old room in a big old house, we are, after all, a big old family. We're a mess sometimes, but God is good, and he makes us good, good enough to sit at his table. Let's pray, and then we're going to start kind of getting ready for dinner. Lord, thank you for our homes. Thank you for the blessing that they are, have been, and can be. And if our homes right now are a mess, we pray that we will realize how blessed we are to know that you can turn the mess into beauty, that through your grace we can become good and our homes can become good. Thank you for the time we're about to enter, this time of reflection. Help us to do this in a way that honors you, blesses us, blesses this family. In Jesus' name, amen. Come to the mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are Good things happen in homes. Good things happen in homes at and around the table. I I don't know that Amy and I did everything or anything necessarily right in raising children, but I do know one thing that I feel really, really good about, and that is that more times out of the week than not, we made a concerted effort to make sure that we were around the table 
for dinner. And really, really good things happen there. Some of the best things, some of the most precious moments, some of the greatest conversations. Now, it didn't always come easily. We played a game in my house called What's the News? So every night at dinner, I would ask the question around the table, what's the news? And they would have to come up with something that had happened during the day, hopefully of significance. We tried to issue that. Um, and sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. Oftentimes it was like pulling teeth. Um, Cody, what's the news? Ah, the Smith look. But we kept pressing and we kept pushing and finally something would come up and that would lead to this. And then one of the boys would say this and Amy might offer that. Some of you have been guests in our home and you've had to play What's the News and it's the same kind of thing. But good things happen when you're around the table. And we shared a lot of stuff. Interesting, this fall, this is the first time in 20 years that I'll look at Amy and go, what's the news? And that's it, because it's only the two of us. Analogy, in a sense. We're not going to be asking what's the news around the room today. But as we take our moment of silence, if you can imagine God asking you, what's the news? Pat, what's the news? What's the news, Lane? What's the news, Michelle? And it's a time to say, I'm concerned about this. I care about this. I'm hurting here. I'm afraid of this. I'm really, really excited about this that's happened. It's a time to share that moment with God and see what kind of a word he has for you. Let's sing again and then we'll pray. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread, all who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Some of us don't like our jobs. The news is that some of us are struggling in our relationships with our spouses. The news is that some of us are just really concerned about our kids. The news is, is that all of us have a longing for something more. And the only thing that can fill it is you. And the news is, God, that you're giving us your son, and that news is good. And we remember his sacrifice, and we are grateful for the good news of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus as we take this bread together and all that agree say, amen.
table of mercy, the table of feasting, the table of righteousness. And as we consider not physically but gathering around that table, being accepted, being equal, being forgiven, we can only offer our thanks and declare our praise for who you are and all the mighty things that you've done. Most importantly, the giving of your son and his blood on our behalf. We thank you for the table. In Jesus' name we pray and all that agree say amen. When I was lost and deep in sin, you sent your Holy Spirit in. You cleansed my heart, you made it new, and now I see my praise. I praise you, Lord, for who you are, and all my 
You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or Children's Ministry, a ter terrific Tuesday that will be here at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. We still need summer volunteers for our children's ministry and for our Christian summer camp. Um, Dinner and a Devo continues this Wednesday. Uh, elder recommendation forms are out. You need to pick those up. A lot of things going on, a lot of good things. So please make sure that you're t paying attention to everything that involves you. And this morning before we close, a special word from a good friend of ours, Scott Sager from Lipscomb University. Hi, I'm Scott Sager from Lipscomb University inviting you to join us for summer celebration June 28th through 30th on the beautiful campus of Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. We'll be studying Paul's unifying core, the message of Romans, and we want you to be a part of an exciting three days with nine keynote speakers, over 100 classes, children's program, youth program, music, and more. We want you to be a part of what should be a wonderful three-day study as we celebrate what unites us, our unifying core from the message of the book of Romans. Please come and join us. Register online. We'd love to have you here. It'll be a great three days. Awesome. Scott, of course, has been here many, many times. He runs that program for Lipscomb. And so I encourage you to take a look at, you can go online to summercelebration.com at, e, at lipscomb.edu and see the schedule and the speakers and all that good stuff. But there's some really good things that will be happening up there in that week, so please consider that. Again, thanks for being here, and we will close in prayer. James, come and lead us. Have a great week. Our kind, most heavenly Father, we come to you standing in awe of you, Father, of all your greatness, of all the things you give to us, for your love, for your kindness, for your mercy. Father, we, we bow down and worship you. We offer our lives to you this week. Father, we just want to lift up to you today our families and our homes. Father, uh, reach out to them, touch them, uh, give them special blessings. Father, we know that you do that every day, but Father, we just want to ask that you bless them this week. We have every family imaginable, Father. We have those who, who are celebrating the birth or soon to celebrate the birth. We have many who have, who have lost people they love recently. We have families who, are, who are, have kids going away from their homes. We have 
families who are who are tight and united. We have families who are struggling. Father, we have every man, every part of uh, of life, every struggle, every celebration, Father. And through all of those struggles and all those celebrations, Father, we just ask that that you be a part of those, that we glorify you with our lives. And Father, uh, help us this week to be your light shining on a hill. Help us to be your word. Help us to be the salt. Help us to be what you want us to be. Give us compassion and love. Give us vision. Get, let us see our families uh, through your eyes and not our eyes this week, Father. And, and for those in our families who are really struggling to figure out uh, where they are and who they are and whose they are, Father, just just help them. Send them the Spirit this week to help them see their way in life more clearly. And Father, we just praise you. We love you. And we hope that we honor you with our lives this week. And God's family said, Amen.